This episode of The Startup Life is brought to you by People Ready. Startup Nation, you have a lot on your plate. The last thing you need to stress about is finding quality staff or the available work you need to be successful. Save time and headache by working with a trusted staffing partner that meets your everyday needs. People Ready is a national staffing provider with over 600 locations across the country and 30 plus years of experience serving people just like you. They specialize in a variety of industries including retail, manufacturing, logistics, general cleaning, hospitality, construction, and more. People Ready understands that you're busy and on the go. That's where their mobile app, JobStack, comes in. Use the app to place orders or find work 24-7 or wherever you are. And as social distancing continues to change the way we interact with customers, colleagues, and our everyday lives, JobStack provides the ability to find the right temporary workers or work you need while eliminating the amount of physical touch points needed in the staffing process. Visit PeopleReady.com forward slash Startup Life to learn more about how you can partner with People Ready. Hey, Startup Nation. So for today's episode of the Startup Life, we did things a little differently. So you're going to still get your two segments, but we're going to have two guests. In the first half of the show, we're going to have Dr. Bobby Palmer. He's an award-winning professor at the University of Virginia. and He's going to talk about his new book and his film, Fishing with Dynamite. In the second half of the show, we'll have Mark Morial, who is the president and CEO of the National Urban League, and he's going to talk about his latest book, The Gumbo Coalition. So I hope you're ready to get some value because the startup life begins now. It's time to be about that life, the startup life. Here's your host, Dominic Lawson. All right, Startup Nation. So I hope you're ready to receive some value today. My name is Dominic Lawson, and this is The Startup Life, the show for entrepreneurs and career minded professionals. You know, Startup Nation, when we hear the word capitalism, you know, there's usually a certain way of thinking when it comes to that, right? You know, as we go forth in our business or even scaling the corporate ladder, sometimes capitalism has been seen as kind of a naughty word but today's guest has a different way of looking at it and we're going to ask him a few questions about that he is an award-winning professor at the darden school of business at the university of virginia along with fellow professor ed freeman he co-authored the book the power of and responsible business without trade-offs he's also uh, the producer and stars in the documentary Fishing with Dynamite that I absolutely had the pleasure of seeing not too long ago. And Startup Nation, that documentary is actually streaming uh, on all streaming platforms just about uh, right now. We have a link there in the show notes for easy access. He is Startup Nation, Dr. Bobby Parmar. Dr. B, how's it going, my man? I'm doing great, Dominic. Thanks so much for having me on the show. No worries. No worries. So, you know what? Let's just get into it. If you would, can I just share with us your origin story and your background a little bit, if you would, if you don't mind? Of course. So, uh, I was born to immigrant parents. Uh, in in Chicago. Okay. So grew up, grew up in Chicago. Uh, you know, was kind of a quiet, nerdy kid. Did a lot of reading. Wasn't very athletic. Uh, started doing martial arts when I was uh, in my in my teens. It's changed my life. Gotcha. You know, that kind of working out. But uh, ultimately, that led me to a career in business ethics. So okay. thinking about you know martial arts is about using your power responsibly. Mm. And business ethics is about, you know, using the power of corporations responsibly. Sure. And so there's some, some parallels there, but my background is I'm a social psychologist and a moral philosopher. Okay. I've, been okay. teach, I've been teaching at the Darden School of Business for the last 12 years, where I have the pleasure of working with so many fantastic students and my amazing colleagues. Right. I, teach, I teach business ethics here, and I do a lot of work consulting with organizations and mentoring several of our students who are starting their own firms. I heard that. Thank you for sharing that. Just, you, if you would, quick follow-up, if you would, just kind of share with me, you know, the joy you get out of teaching and stuff like that when you're engaging with your students and stuff like that. There, it is a phenomenal feeling. You know, you feel so motivated when you have, you know, in, in our sections at Darden, there are 65 students who are passionate and hungry and, you know, just soaking up everything. And they, you know, they challenge you too. And that's great. Like we teach by the case method. So everything is conversational. And um, I, I learn from them just as much as they learn from me. But I say there's a responsibility as an educator, particularly in the context of business ethics. We want to help our students have the, the vision and the skills to create a better world, but also be equipped to deal with the imperfect world that they'll find themselves in, Absolutely. you know, and it's a, it's a difficult thing. It's a difficult line to walk, right? You don't want to just 
hype them up and say everything is great uh, and then have them hit reality when they go into their companies or found their own companies and vice versa. You can't pick, paint a picture of gloom and doom either because right. you know, they're the generation that can make some, some positive changes. So that's always a tricky line to walk, but it's such an important thing. Absolutely. So I feel... I feel honored to be able to do that work. I heard that. I heard that, you know, and in in that same vein, uh, I, I want to ask you this because, you know, as we are engaging in our new normal due to, you know, the coronavirus and everything, you know, you know, there's a lot of uh, different uh, businesses not doing so well, you know, and stuff like that. But when you talk about business ethics and the coronavirus and, and everything that's going on with business right now, how do you turn uh, this into a teachable moment to yours for your students? Oh, it's such a great question. So, you know, what I think coronavirus is doing for all kinds of companies, large and small, is that it's a defining moment. Right. It's creating a set of choices that we didn't have to make decisions on before, you know, thinking right. about when to come back to work, how to come back to work safely, how to support our employees in our communities, you know, thinking about things like, do we give refunds? for products and services that our customers have paid for but are not using in the context of right. COVID-19 when you think about things like car insurance or, or, or things like that. So it, it provides a defining moment where our stakeholders are looking at these organizations and saying, look, now it's a tough time. Did you make this time tougher on me or did you make this time a little bit more bearable? And I really believe that it's a time where stakeholders will look out into the future and remember what organizations and businesses have done for them in this moment. And it will pay it will pay dividends in the future, how companies, particularly if they're able to treat their stakeholders fairly. You know, and I know that that's not something that every company is in the um has the ability to do, but it's not just about outcomes, right? Fairness is also about process. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Startup Nation, that brings me to uh, uh, the movie Fishing with Dynamite. And it really talks about a lot of these type of uh, doctrines and processes and stuff like that. So if you would, uh, you know, Dr. B, just kind of share with us a little bit about the film and uh, and your role in it and stuff like that. Sure. So Fishing with Dynamite is a film that asks the question, what is the purpose of business in society? Right. Now, for lots of folks, that's a really easy question, right? When I'm talking with folks on the street or meeting folks for the first time, that answer is easy. The purpose of business is to make as much money as possible. Right. But it turns out that that story, what we call the old story of business, is not a really useful story, particularly in times of challenge like the COVID-19 crisis, but also you know, in the ways that we see companies creating value for all of their stakeholders, not just shareholders, thinking about how do we create an environment where our employees can succeed, where our suppliers and partners can thrive, where we can be good citizens in the community. There's a growing body of research that shows that when companies take care of those stakeholders, they actually do better financially. So there's a lot of myths that this movie tries to bust, right? It tries to bust this myth that companies should and can only care about shareholders. Gotcha. Uh, and it tries to show that there is another way of conducting business that not only is more motivating and engaging and purpose-driven, but also has better outcomes for all the folks that are involved. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. You know, Dr. B, how do we get here? Because honestly, like when I when I think of the word capitalism, I think of it like a hammer. You can use it to build a house or you can build it, use it to hurt somebody with, right? And so it seems like a lot of times, a lot of people associate capitalism with like hurting somebody, but in just making a whole bunch of money and not really giving, you know, uh, two cares about the little guy and stuff like that. How did we get to this point? Another great question, Dominic. So I think that, you know, there was a time where yeah, American business, like particularly post-World War II, yeah. American business uh, practitioners, and at the time they were mostly men, right, right? Um, right. saw themselves as stewards of big institutional forces in society. They saw themselves as giving back to society. Gotcha. And in, in the late 60s and 70s, what we found was this American prosperity was on the wane. Countries like Japan and Germany were quickly ramping up manufacturing. They were selling high quality goods at lower prices. And American companies, because there was this model of a, co a conglomeration where they were just become really big companies, companies that, you know, on one hand are selling cigarettes and making cookies. Mm -hmm. Like it just didn't make sense how big these companies were. So they were slow to respond to this much more nimble competition. 
So in the late 60s and early 70s, there was this movement to try to get American companies to be more nimble, more efficient. And there were a group of scholars, actually, Milton Friedman, Michael Jensen at Harvard Business School, who said, look, the way to get American companies and the American economy back on track is to stop focusing on society and start focusing on shareholders, because shareholders will help you be more efficient. And that ushered in this movement in the 80s and even in the early 90s, where American companies primarily cut costs by reducing wages, which led to increased income inequality, you know, uh, cut the ways in which they would invest in communities in order to maximize value for shareholders. Right. And, and, a, and a prototypical example of that is what happened with BP in 2010 in the Deepwater Horizon. So engineers at BP were trying to save a million dollars a day when it comes to the couplings on those oil wells, right? So tra- to change those couplings every day cost a million dollars. So to save that cost, they said, you know what, we're not going to do it every day, which led to the failure of that well and that huge oil spill in the Gulf. But it ended up costing the company $61.6 billion wow. of value, right. right? So that's a huge you know, penny-wise, pound-foolish kind of decision that gets made when you focus only on shareholders. There's nothing wrong with shareholders. Most of us are shareholders, right? We want to see our companies do well. But we care, we care about how they make that money. We care about doing it in a way that's sustainable, not pumping up those profits short-term in order to get that boost in share price, but doing it in ways where we're creating new products and services and we're hiring folks and we're building our communities so that business can fulfill the profit, uh, the promise of being this engine for society. Absolutely. I, I definitely believe it. Thank you for sharing that because I, I do believe that business can be an engine for society and do good and do good in the community. I know a lot of times, you know, I, I, I'm here in Memphis, Tennessee, and I know there's a lot of many businesses, you know, because look, let's be honest, Memphis, Tennessee is not it's not New York when it comes to socioeconomic or situations and stuff like that. And so I know a lot of businesses here are doing uh, that work and, and they're moving society forward through uh, their businesses and stuff like that. So I appreciate you sharing all of that, Dr. B. Thanks, Dominic. No worries. No worries. So I, I want to ask you this because, you know, one of the things that comes up in the film quite often is the stakeholder theory. Can you break that down for us? What does that mean? And is, I also saw that, you know, there was a company that had the stakeholder uh, idea a long time ago, like even in the, in the 1930s, like a, a certain computer. Yeah. Company. Yeah. Yeah. So the stakeholder idea is an idea that was created by my friend, colleague and mentor, Edward Freeman right. in the early 1980s. And basically it's this idea that businesses have a series of stakeholders. These are folks who can be affected by the company and can affect how the company achieves its mission and goals. Right. And, you know, Ed will say that this is such a common sense idea. You got to think about your employees and your customers and communities and your partners and your shareholders in the way that you make your day-to-day business decisions, right? right? And he came up with this idea when he was a consultant and he was working with senior executives at a lot of the big companies in the early 80s. And so he noticed what they were doing. They were spending a lot of time meeting with community groups, meeting with unions, talking with you know, partners. And he noticed like, hey, the models that we have to explain what executives do don't take into account what they actually do, mm-hmm. which is spend time with and manage relationships with stakeholders. Now, that's in contrast to a view of business that was on the ascendancy in the early 70s, which is the shareholder model of corporations, which right. is shareholders own the company. Share you as a, as a leader of a business corporation, your job is to work for shareholders. And what shareholders care about is maximizing profits and you know, the value of their stock. Now, that's, that's not true for a variety of reasons. Shareholders have what we call heterogeneous motives. There's lots of shareholders who care about the environment, who care about treating employees well. You know, long-term and short-term shareholders differ on how you want to invest in the company. Should should I invest in this innovation? Well, it might take three years before we see the benefit. Long-term shareholders care a lot about that. Folks who want to flip the stock don't want to care about that. So the stakeholder theory of business is this idea that business leaders need to focus on and successful businesses thrive because they're able to develop strong relationships with all of their stakeholders. Now, which stakeholders matter, how much they matter changes from business to business, industry to industry. 
But you got to think carefully about what's the nature of that relationship. How do I create more value for them? And how can I learn from them about how to run my business more effectively? Absolutely. And many times, you know, this, this shareholder view of business comes with what we call a fixed pie mentality, which is there's just a certain amount of resource in the company. You know, there are only a certain amount of profits, and we've got to be careful to make sure that most of those profits go to shareholders and not employees in the form of raises or benefits or not communities in the way in which we invest or support community initiatives or not suppliers in the way that we negotiate contracts. But actually, there's research that shows that when you take care of your other stakeholders, you actually increase the size of the pie for all of them. So shareholders do better off when corporate leaders and entrepreneurs pay attention to all their stakeholders. I absolutely agree with that. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. And another question about the film I had is that like, I didn't realize that a lot of times CEOs, uh, you know, uh, salary is like tied to share price and stuff like that. Kind of talk about that a little bit. Yeah. It's a, it's a movement that's increased since the early nineties when the Clinton administration signed into law, this idea that, um, companies could deduct the compensation for senior executives when that their senior executives compensation was tied to an objective metric. And they looked around and they found this objective metric, which was share price. So CEOs looked around and they said, Hey, look, if my compensation, uh, you know, bonus compensation, and then later on things like stock options are tied to the share price, it narrowed their focus. Mm. They start to pay attention to what's happening to the stock. Right. Because I could cash out in two years or three years. And what we, one of the things we know is that the amount of time, the tenure of senior executive CEOs at large companies is shrinking. They're not staying around for 15, 20 years. They're staying around for three years, five years, which makes them naturally more short-sighted because they're going to make decisions that increase the value of their compensation when they exit the organization in three years, rather than decisions that benefit the enterprise five, 10 years down the line. So that's a big problem, thinking about CEO compensation. And I was just reading a study that showed that companies that actually, that take into a long-term perspective in the way that they compensate their senior executives, when share it's not just your short-term share price, but your long-term share price that you can you know, benefit from, they actually perform better. They outperform the market significantly. And so, again, thinking about the benefit to your stakeholders in a longer term perspective, when you're not forced to make short sighted decisions that are narrow, benefits everyone. Right. There's no trade off that's that's built there. Absolutely. You know what? I'm glad you said that about the short term versus the long term startup nation. As you've been noticing for the past couple of weeks, as we engage and move forward through the coronavirus and and this pandemic and the economic impact it has had, a lot of our guests have been saying, talking about focusing not just on short term, but also long term as well. And that's been a common theme, Dr. B, throughout this entire pandemic. Why is that? If you don't mind me asking. Well, because I think this is such an important time for people. You know, lots of people all around the world, particularly in our country, are hurting in many different ways. Now, whether they, whether it's job security, income inequality, having their hours cut, you know, mm-hmm. social and racial justice, and right. these are things that matter to us deeply. Right. And therefore, when a company acts in ways that are counter our values, people have long memories for that. Right. And so, right. when when you think long term, you have the courage and the bravery to do what's right. So that people remember in the long term, hey, you took care of me or you were we fought side by side for an important cause when it mattered, mm. you know, and now that I have the, the ability to buy your product or service or support you or tell a friend who's incredibly talented to apply for a job position at your organization, there are ways in which this can come back, mm-hmm. right? So there, there's also a lot of pressure when you're fighting a crisis to make decisions that could end up hurting you in the long term. And so encouraging business leaders to make sure that we're not making short-sighted decisions is important not so that not just so that they'll recover from the crisis but so that they can set themselves up for a trajectory of increased growth when we're back to a position where 
more growth as possible. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. And once again, Startup Nation, the film is Fishing with Dynamite. We have uh, a link there in the show notes if you want to check out the website. And that that movie is streaming now on all, uh, all your favorite streaming websites for sure. I want to ask you this, Dr. B, really quickly, if you don't mind me, because, you know, uh, as we, you know, and we talked about the, and it was talked about a little bit in uh, the film about the hope for the next generation of entrepreneurs, the next generation of business leaders. You know, we're talking about millennials and Zoomers, and you're you're teaching a lot of that generation right now. What's your hope for that next generation of entrepreneur and business leader? One of the things that I hope for is they don't see business and ethics as antithetical. I think gotcha. I really hope that they see business and ethics as things that go together, that the way I conduct my business has ethics embedded in it, whether it's a decision on who to hire, it's a decision on how to allocate capital, it's a decision on health and safety of different products and services. We are doing ethics every time we're making a business decision because ethics has to do with what is fair, what is good. Right. Good for whom? Who benefits and who's harmed? What is our character? What is our brand? All of those things are things we think about when we're making business decisions. And I got to say that in the 12 years that I've been teaching business students, I have only seen interest in ethics and responsibility grow. Mm -hmm. When I first started to teach, you know, bef before the global financial crisis, there were still some folks who who were wondering why ethics is a required course at Darton. Like, why, why, do we got, why do we got to do this? I'm a good person. I went to church or temple or mosque. I don't need, I don't need an ethics class. Right. And a lot of what we work on is to show people that, look, even, even people who are good people can make terrible decisions because the kinds of decisions that we have to make in business are not the kinds of decisions that we learned about at church or from our grandmother or right. from our parents. These are, these are tough calls. And, we can really benefit when we exercise our judgment and critical thinking to make these tough calls. And training in ethics helps us do that. So over these last 12 years, I've seen students say less and less, why do we have an ethics class? And say more and more, I want to learn how to do this better and more effectively because this is so important. I care about working at companies that take ethics and responsibility seriously and diversity and inclusion seriously. I care about working at companies that want to make the world a better place. And so it's been one of the reasons I love teaching at Darden is ethics is one of the top rated courses here. Wow. At most business schools, you know, ethics is an add on. It's hard to get students excited about it. But we, we do well here, and that's because our students come hungry for trying to help make the world a better place and using business as a vehicle, as you said, as a hammer, to help craft a more just, a more equitable, and a better world for all of us. For sure. For sure. Thank you for sharing that. And, and Startup Nation, if you want to check out the Darden uh, School of Business, go to the uh, link in the show notes for the easy access if you listen to the replay on the website. If you listen on radio, it's darden.virginia.edu. And then once again, if you listen to the replay on the podcast, we have a link there in the show notes for easy access access now dr b you know considering everything going on man june is kind of a rock star month for you you not only have <laughs> this uh this uh this documentary out but you also have a book out now and once again startup nation that book is the power of and responsible business without trade-offs just kind of talk about the book a little bit and how it came together and working with your your mentor on it uh ed freeman with it as well yeah, thanks so much, Dominic. You know, this was a collaboration between my close friend and mentor, Ed Freeman, and my dear friend and colleague, Kirsten Martin, Absolutely. who's now at Notre, at, at Notre Dame. And, and the book really takes the ideas in the film and tries to put a little bit more meat on those bones. Gotcha. And the idea behind the book is that, you know, thriving companies, successful companies don't get caught up, caught up in this trade-off mindset. I either can make, create value for our shareholders or stakeholders. They do both of those things. Gotcha. I can either be ethical or make a lot of money. They do both of those things. I can either focus on being competitive in the marketplace or being a great place or a great community. They do both of those things. Right. And, you know, one of the things that my students wonder about a lot is, you know, they think trade-offs are natural. Like you're just walking around and you run into a trade-off. <laughs> and a trade-off is a way of framing a decision, mm. right? It's, it's a function of your choice set. So when you have a choice that you can have A and B, you don't have to make a trade-off. If your choice set is only I can have A or only I can have B, then you're forced to make a trade-off. So one of the things I think entrepreneurs do so well is they look around in society and they say, Here's a trade-off that customers have to make right now. They could either have this thing that 
increases security, or they have to pay a lot. How do I find a way to do this at a cheaper cost? Or they say, look, given this price point, this is the quality level. How can I do this in a way where customers don't have to pay more, but they can have higher quality? Mm. And so they do the work to create a set of choices, whether they're choices about products to buy or, pro- or you know, systems and organizations, services to sell, where you don't have to make that trade-off. And we see that that's just not entrepreneurs. You know, great leaders in existing businesses are doing that too. They don't just default to a set of options that are given to them. They look around and they say, wait, if I made this option, that would mean that I would take a hit on this thing that I care about, whether that's customer satisfaction, employee morale, my brand and the way that I stand in the community. I don't like that. So let me create a set of options where I don't have to make that trade-off. Gotcha. So the book, the book catalogs companies that are doing this work, and it pulls together a set of principles all over the world. We're seeing these movements now that are trying to reform capitalism and and get capitalists and capitalism to think more carefully about its purpose. You know, conscious capitalism is a great organization. There's another organization called capitalism, you know, 24902, which sounds like a soap opera, but 24902 is the circumference of the earth, you know, and it's about capitalism and sustainability. Um, Stakeholder capitalism is another version of this. So the book distills a set of these principles, no matter what you call it, no matter what group you belong to, there's a set of, principles when it comes to stakeholder value and purpose and committing to ethics and responsibility that hold these different movements together, it provides examples of companies that are doing this already and already trying to move the needle. And a set of questions and things for business leaders to think about if they're motivated to to make these kinds of changes. And we're seeing a series of forces in our society that are increasing the pace of this change, you know, one of which is the advent of the internet and information technology, it's harder and harder for companies that are bad actors to hide. You know, when right. when employees can post information on Glassdoor.com and shareholders can see, you know, inside the company and how, how decisions are being made, it's a lot easier to catch, you know, misbehavior. And so executives are catching on and saying, look, we're seeing growth in our products and services that are, you know, ethics and responsibility focused. You know, we're able to attract top talent from around the world. This is something that matters. How do we do this better? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that for sure. And Startup Nation, you can actually per- – we have a link there in the show notes for easy access uh, to purchase the book as well. Uh, so, you know, we're, once again, we're wrapping up uh, with Dr. Bobby Palmer, uh, award-winning professor at the Darden School of Business at University of Virginia. You know, you know I'm actually going to turn the microphone over to you, Dr. B, because, you know, as, as we engage and move forward – uh, with everything going on, you know, there's a lot of business owners. There's a next generation of business owners. They're feeling a little discouraged to either uh, continue in the market or jump into the market of entrepreneurship. Kind of leave us, leave us with some words of encouragement to take us out for today, if you would, sir. Thank you for that opportunity, Dominic. I think it's such a valuable thing to be able to speak to all of these folks who are on the front lines, you know, who are who are suffering through a lot of different difficult decisions, maybe difficult circumstances with COVID-19 and with all the things that are happening in our country. And one of the things that keeps me going uh, when things get tough is to remember the people who came before me, whether it's my parents or my grandparents or generations even further back than that, who had it even harder, who struggled, who had a life that maybe they couldn't have you know, easily escaped from, who put one foot in front of the other because they dreamed of a generation that had the kind of opportunities and had the kind of choices that I have the privilege to to have. And so I try to remember those folks and say, look, I'm going to take risks. I'm going to do things that are not easy to do because it's not just me. I'm part of a larger story. I'm part of a larger narrative and a larger legacy And I'm so thankful to those previous generations who worked super hard to give me a shot. I'm going to work super hard. Maybe I can't cross the finish line on some of these things, but I want to set up these next generations for success. And that, to me, is a worthwhile, worthwhile life to live. I hear that. I hear that. Thank you so much. And Dr. B, thank you so much for coming on the show, my man. Dominic, thanks so much for having me and for making time. And thanks for doing all this great work that you do with entrepreneurs and business leaders. It's a great value that you had. All right, Startup Nation, so we're going to go ahead and take a quick break. we got to pay some bills. Once again, my name is Dominic Lawson, and you're listening to The Startup Life.
Startup Nation, do you have friends and loved ones that you want to do something nice for, but maybe they live in the next city, the next state, or even halfway around the world? Well, I have a solution for you. Koya is the new and best way to let your friends and family know you're thinking of them. Choose a friend, record a message, and hide it in a location that they are likely to visit and give them a clue. When they arrive, your message will instantly appear. You can even send them a gift. Best of all, the app is completely free. Get Koya.com to download it now. That's K-E-T-K-O-Y-A.com. Or check the link in the show notes. Koya, show you care when you can't be there. All right, Startup Nation, welcome back as we continue our conversation with today's guest here on The Startup Life. You know, Startup Nation, you know, if there was ever a time that leadership was needed, it's right now. And today's guest knows all about that. He is the president and CEO of the National Urban League. He has served as the he served as the 59th mayor of New Orleans and in the Louisiana State Senate. He holds a degree in economics and African-American studies from the University of Pennsylvania and a law degree from Georgetown Law. He is also the author of The Gumbo Coalition, 10 Leadership Lessons That Help You Inspire, Unite, and Achieve. He is a personal hero of mine, Mark Morial. Mark, how are you, sir? Hey, good morning, and uh, I really appreciate being with you, and thank you for the generous introduction. Oh, no worries, no worries. And we ask this of all of our guests. Mark, are you ready to pour some knowledge in the startup nation today? Yes, yes. I'm ready. Awesome, awesome. Let's do it. In fact, I'm I'm fired up. I'm fired up up and ready to go. I hear that. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. So, you know, first things first, Mark, if you would just kind of share with us, you know, with everything going on as we're kind of uh, quarantining and stuff like that, what's what's changed in your new normal? What's your new normal looking like these days from your personal and professional career? This, nor- this, is, this normal has been uh, as unusual as, as any in, in, in modern times with mm-hmm. Uh, I'm now in almost my 100th day working from home. My entire team has been working from home, right? Uh, and, and utilizing technology and figuring out uh, how to uh, how to navigate this new reality. Uh, and now we have uh, uh, a second virus. We have the virus of racism, which has right. reared its ugly head, right? And uh, and, and stunned. Uh, the body politic and uh, caused the, the international outrage across the land. Absolutely. All across the land. Right. And so it's, it's a new normal, but, but it's a time of transformation. You know, it's a time of that we have to step up and understand. It's not about returning to normal. It's about transforming for a better normal. Maybe I can just share with you, uh, you know, COVID uh, I think uh, what, a couple of things that really shook me sure. about COVID. One was the way in which the country was so inadequately prepared for a pandemic. Right. Uh, inadequate testing kits, inadequate uh, PPEs, inadequate uh, just a, a great deal of inadequacy. So when the, when the COVID hit, the country was really uh, there were inadequate tests. So. People could have the virus and not know they had the virus. Right. Uh, there was inadequate equipment for people to protect themselves. Inadequate ventilators and other uh, hospital uh, equipment. Uh, uh, just the inadequacy and, 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 and leadership at the top that seemed to tell us one minute it wasn't serious. The next minute it was very serious. And the third minute it was a hoax. Mm. So, you know, it was a confusion and therefore there was a debate about whether it was real or not. Right. Because you have political leaders differing over the magnitude of uh, of the crisis, which was certainly validated by facts uh, and evidence of uh, 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 and health numbers and hospital admissions and uh, very important information that we had. So, you know, that reality uh, and, and then that reality also produced the 40 million people who were unemployed right. uh, in America today. Uh, and, and and as we begin to discuss how things get back to reopening, then we have the incident with Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd, right. which uh, stunned and created uh, protests in American cities unlike anything we have seen. Spontaneous, right. organic outrage 
and now protests all across the, the world, from Europe to Asia, right? Right. From Europe to Asia, all across the world. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, you're, and you're absolutely right. You know, uh, and I want to go back to something you were just saying as far as like the response to COVID-19, because in your book, you talk about how you prepared and you set up New Orleans to prepare for those natural you know, disasters and, and, and stuff like that. Kind of talk about what are some of those lessons that, you know, leaders at the top that you talk about? What are some of those lessons that are in your book that people can learn when it comes to kind to, you know, um, preparing for things like that on ahead of time, but also when it does happen, uh, you know, how to respond. Preparation and planning, preparation and planning. Right. You know, every, every city should know, uh, have an idea of what risks, what could happen, and you have to prepare and plan. But even in a crisis, even in a crisis, you have to sometimes improvise, react on the spot, develop responses because you're going to face the unforeseen. And I talk in the book about not being paralyzed by the unexpected uh, and the need in a, in a crisis to find the best, you know, you should know in advance, depending on the crisis, who are my experts, who are my resources? Uh, I always uh, believe that uh, uh, you, uh, you know, you have to plan in advance to the best of your ability uh, and then if you had to put together improvisations, it needed to be done by team, by team. No one person uh, can indeed do it. So whether it's a weather emergency or hurricane or flood, you know, whether it's a, a, a crisis, we had a crisis in New Orleans where a freighter uh, on the Mississippi River lost control and plowed in uh, to, a, to, a, to a, a riverside hotel and shopping center, which was built right on the river. Uh, and luckily no one died, but the devastation and the damage was substantial and significant. Uh, and, and we had to respond to that. Uh, this is uh, a lesson for all leaders, which is you have to have planning. You have to have uh, uh, people in place. You have to be prepared for the unexpected and you have to sit down and, uh, and, uh, and, and ask yourself, what, you know, what is it that we may be at risk for? Look, the idea of a pandemic, uh, there were apparently a, a pandemic, a, a pandemics unit at the National Security Council that was disbanded. And we've had pandemics before. And look, modern medicine uh, eliminated the threat of smallpox and polio, uh, highly contagious diseases, leprosy highly contagious diseases that affected, you know, millions of people. And modern medicine created ways that we could protect ourselves. But uh, as biology is, as human beings are, as animals are, uh, there can be new viruses and new health emergencies that emerge. HIV AIDS was one uh, 35 to 40 years ago. Uh, this pandemic coronavirus, we don't know all that we need to know about it. We don't know if we can develop a safe uh, and universally available, uh, verifiable and reliable vaccine. We don't know, right. but we certainly want to find out. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing all of that. You know, Startup Nation, in the book, you know, the Gumbo Coalition, and e at the end of each chapter, there are these Gumbo Coalition recaps. Harper Collins is really good about having these recaps uh, for books. But one of the ones that stood out was, and, and you mentioned this, chapter six, um, plan your second move before you make your first. Make your moves with careful consideration, anticipation, and w anticipation anticipating the reaction. Sorry about that. You know, and, and I just love that quote because it really speaks to, you know, not necessarily just moving, right? Like just doing something. We always talk about the, the rock, rock and chair leadership or that flailing thing you see at car dealerships, like you're moving, but you're not really doing anything. So I really appreciate you putting uh, that part in the book, Mark, for sure. Let me say this. I, I had so much, so much uh, excitement and joy writing the book. Uh, after going through a great deal of anxiety at the very beginning, mm -hmm. because it's a huge project. But what we wanted to do is create something that people could use. 
not just a story for the sake of a story, right. but a story that tells a lesson. And so we created all of those sort of recommendations, which are leadership recommendations. Absolutely. Uh, to help people, no matter what you lead, whether you're the pastor of a church, you're the leader of a big business, you're developing your own startup, you lead a volunteer organization, uh, uh, no matter what it is, you're a coach. Uh, these lessons are lessons I learned through uh, through participation and observation, uh, watching and participating and uh, getting an understanding of how uh, leadership work when leadership is the science of, of of organizing people and and directing people towards a common goal. That's what leadership is all about. And uh, in, in the book, I talk about planning. I talk about modifying a plan. I talk about communicating effectively a plan. Uh, I talk about innovation and networking. Uh, I talk about not being paralyzed uh, by the unexpected. You know, I tell stories of people uh, high and low uh, who uh, impress me. I talk about Ants versus crabs. Right. Or the idea of working together versus excessively competing with each other. You know, this, you know, this is the, this book is, I think, a great, great tool. Uh, I hope particularly for young leaders and emerging leaders and people who want to become leaders. Right. Right. You know, and I have to agree with you, Mark, because I think, you know, as we, you know, when we talk about the class of 2020 and the new class of emerging leaders, I think this book is really great. It's a really great handbook uh, for that regard. You know, you, and you referenced the ant versus crab uh, part of the book, which I thought was fascinating, where you talk about um your interactions with other people in the African-American community. And as far as like, we all have, you know, certain goals, but maybe we disagree with how we get there. Kind of talk about that ant versus crab doctrine. If you, you know that, that, I just, you know, we, 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 we sometimes, there's sometimes a perception that African-American leaders are uh, competing with each other, right? Uh, competing with each other for the stage or for the mic or, uh, who's more prominent, and and sometimes that perception is is not true. But in the past, there's been a great deal of that. So in our dealings with President Obama, a number of us decided that because of the historic nature of his presidency, right, uh, we needed to forge a working relationship with him. We needed to refrain and discipline ourselves from publicly criticizing him. We needed to create an opportunity. To him to be successful because of the legacy, right. uh, you know, a, a, a failed first black president would have uh, emboldened those who said, "You see, a black man can't run the United States, can't be commander in chief, can't lead the nation." Uh, and we understood that element of the Obama presidency, and decided we were going to forge a working relationship with him where we could talk to him privately, talk to his senior aides privately about what we wanted for the community. And it contrasted with, with some who wanted to criticize President Obama, set an unreasonably high bar for him, uh, and appeared, you know, to me to be just involved, involved involving themselves in petty politics. Right. Uh, which, uh, you know, I have no patience for. And I had no place for it. Now, you know, that's not to say that people have a right, don't have a right to criticize President Obama. It's just that we, as civil rights leaders, decided we were not going to associate ourselves with that approach. We made a deliberate, strategic decision. And, uh, you know, people can criticize it, but, you know, it's, it's, you have to have a sense of history. Uh, and we wanted him to succeed, and we said, let's help him succeed. And, and, and there were times when we didn't agree with him uh, strategically and tactically. I thought he didn't move fast enough on things. And there were many times when we, you know, were the first to applaud uh, his actions and applaud his movements and work in the community to advocate uh, for his policies. And that, you know, to me, uh, represented, you know, the idea of an ant, which is a uh, animal that works in teams, right? Uh, and also the strongest animal on earth in terms of its ability to lift 
uh, a ratio of its own weight. The ant is the strongest animal on earth uh, versus a crab. Right. Which is a crab mentality. If I see another crab growing up, I gotta pull that crab down. Right. If somebody's more prominent than me, I, I just, you know, I, I can't I can't stomach it. Right. And so I like that chapter of the book because it tells a point in history and I say, you know, I got so many calls from the press trying to goad me, bait me, right. trick me into criticizing Obama. Right. Right? Into criticizing Obama since I've been around you know, multiple presidents and said, you know, you're asking me questions. You didn't ask me about the previous two presidents. You always call here and say, is, is Obama doing enough for black people? Is Obama, they want, they wanted this story. The story, they had the headline already written. They just didn't have a story underneath the headline. And the headline is black leaders criticize Obama. That's the story they wanted to write. Absolutely. They wanted to write about a family feud. And, uh, you know, we didn't give them a family feud. I mean, we didn't give them, we wouldn't give it to them. And that was part of, it was very deliberate, you know, on our on our part. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. I, I appreciate that. And I think that's an important message, Mark, because, you know, right now, as, you know, we're seeing, you know, uh, the, the protest around the country and around the world, like you talked about before, we in the African-American community are having uh, those type of conversations and and paying attention to who kind of goads us to kind of get the story for the press and the media and stuff like that. So I appreciate you sharing all of that for sure. Oh, oh yeah. and look, let me say this. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say you know on, on that score, on that score, you know the the Obama presidency uh, was was all in all you know a, a successful presidency. Right. We rated the uh, the Obama presidency and. Uh, in rating the Obama presidency after he left office, we had to decide what we, what were we going to rate him based on, you know, right. a hypothetical standard right. of perfection, a comparison to his predecessors as president. And we decided that we were going to look at the condition of the country the day he took office and the condition of the country the day he left office right. and ask if black people were better off. And in many categories, we were and some we were not. Right. And was the nation at large better off than when he started? Right. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. I I, pre I really appreciate that for sure. Uh, I want to ask you this because, you know, when you took over as, as mayor uh, in New Orleans, you, you had to, you know, one of the things that you ran on was, you know, being tough on crime and stuff like that. And, you know, we were talking about this earlier about uh, about the the virus that is racism and uh, also how it, it's uh, kind of linked to police brutality and things of that nature. Kind of talk about, you know, because you did this effectively well in New Orleans. Talk about what it looks like for policing in our communities Policing with compassion. What does that look like? Policing with compassion uh, is the philosophy of community-oriented policing. And it's not over-policing. It's not crackdown policing. It's about policing that builds relationships with people in the community to address the problems that people in the community want to see addressed. It's about how you train police officers. It's about how you discipline police officers. We completely changed the philosophy. And look, my time, we were dealing with a very serious problem of violence right. and, and, and murder in black New Orleans. Uh, 500 murders, public housing developments were shooting galleries. We had to get on top of that in a number of ways. But I took the approach that I was going to create a more effective approach to policing, and I was going to invest heavily in positive programs for youth. So summer job programs, camps, all types of things we were going to invest in these communities. We were going to open every swimming pool. Those that were not repaired, we were going to fix. I was going to over-invest in kids, and I was going to give – we had midnight basketball. We had starlight, which was for girls, basketball. We created a whole series of – Recreation programs for girls. It was saying, I'm not going to just do policing, but I'll do effective policing. And I'm going to do programs, right? Programs and initiatives that invest in youth. And it was a formula about uh, hol holism. Everybody talks about holistic approaches, but very seldom uh, do you see 
holistic approaches. Many people, the minute they want to deal with violence and crime in a the community, they think it's all about policing. Uh, and, and, and I believe in, in investing in communities, investing in people, but having an effective police department. And we, we changed dramatically how we policed in these neighborhoods. But, you know, we concentrated on violent crime. We concentrated on you know, drug dealers and shootings and things like that, because that's what the community told us. The community said, this is what we want you to focus on. Right. This is what we want you to focus on. And so it was a formula that worked. And I, I think it's a formula that ought to be embraced on a national level. I think that the, uh, the, uh, the federal government and, and the philanthropic foundations in America ought to invest in summer jobs. We need to put teenagers, put young people to work, not just fast food jobs. Uh, yesterday, Congressman Cedric Richmond, who is a prominent member of the Democratic Caucus and uh, the representative from New Orleans, right. uh, got a summer job in my summer jobs program. He told me yesterday, he said, you know, I worked at Louisiana State University Dental School. That was my summer job. I'm talking about summer jobs that expose kids to career opportunities and workplace opportunities that are going to inspire their talent and help them think about who they want to be. We've got to invest in young people. We've got to create opportunities for young people. We have to invest public and private money in doing it. We have to show young people we believe in them. We have confidence in them. We have to make college uh, and community college more affordable. Uh, but we've got to start kids. I, you know, have an idea to take uh, uh, make a work a work a job a part of one's high school curriculum. Let them earn money and then get a grade on how they perform in the workplace. Right. You know, we've got to. This right. is the 21st century. We've got to do some things differently. We've got to build on things that have worked in the past, and and we've got to do things at scale. Uh, to uh, to uh, to save this nation and and to confront the uh, opportunity and equality gaps uh, and, and deal with racism and we have to have a, a a a moment and and so we need leadership to do that right. and I hope my book uh, demonstrates uh, or helps people inspires people and gives them tips gives them lessons that they might be able to apply and use uh, with respect to leadership. Sure. Once again, Startup Nation, we're talking to Mark Morial, the author of The Gumbo Coalition. That book is out today. We have a link there in the show notes uh, for easy access if you want to uh, go ahead and purchase that book, if you listen to the replay uh, on the podcast. I'll, I'll just ask you this and I'll let you go because, you know, we, we have a lot of businesses, major businesses around the country who are coming out and giving statements and stuff like that. And I know in your book, you talked about uh, your memorandum of understanding or MOU, if you will, kind of talk about what that was and how that can be applied today in businesses today to kind of affect change. It, 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 so it's really a, 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 an agreement between a corporation and, uh, and the community. Sure. around diversity, very focused on diversity, increasing diversity in the employment, increasing the diversity in what the corporation spends with outside businesses, increasing the diversity, the, the, the philanthropy, the philanthropic donations uh, uh, across the board. And these, these MOUs were an innovation because through it, a company makes a commitment. Right. They commit to have a diversity plan, to have an external diversity council, uh, and and to make meaningful progress uh, towards uh, these uh, the benefits in these areas, and so it is an approach for a company that truly, truly wants to be. It's to me the gold standard, or if you will, the platinum standard in diversity is to engage in in, in a memorandum of understanding around diversity with community-based groups and civil rights organizations. So in our coalition. We've got two African American, two uh, Asian, and two uh, Latino focused civil rights groups, and so it's a multicultural group. Uh, and these uh, these MOUs, I think, are, are are pioneering in terms of trying to help companies make progress. Gotcha. And the company's got to be serious, and they've got to be committed to do it. And we just entered into a, a most recent one with T-Mobile, which just purchased Sprint. Right. And so the work on that 
implementation will probably start in the next few months. Gotcha. Thank you for sharing that. Mark, I know you got to jump on another call, but I just want to say thank you so much for your time and your energy and the work hey, that man. you do with the uh, Urban League. You're a great, you're a great American. You, uh, you uh, have given me a great opportunity to just share today. I want to thank you for what you're doing. It's just been great. We've got to work hard. Uh, we've got to, it's time to end hate and racism. It I really is. Anything I can ever do, just let me know. I'm, I'm, I'm there in your corner, Mark. The Gumbo Coalition can lessen to help you achieve and inspire and unite. And there it is. And you can purchase that book today. Thank you so much, Mark. Talk to you soon. All right. God bless All you. Right. If you want to let us know what you think about our show, have an idea for a show topic, or would like to advertise on our show, send us a message on the Startup Life Podcast Facebook page. And while you are there, like and follow our page as well. It's a great way for us to engage with you, Startup Nation, and really grow our community. The link is there in the show notes. Subscribe to the show as it can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, or even on your Facebook timeline or any other platform you like to get your podcast. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you find our content valuable, please give us a five-star rating as it will help us climb the charts and help more people find our show. You can also listen to the show on the Startup Life Podcast new website. There you will find the all-new startup blog where I write on many topics that are interesting and helpful to you on your path to entrepreneurship. And hey, If you have an idea, be about that life, the startup life.